Greetings, everyone. What a great morning. Congratulations to Fred, to Landon, to the entire Atlantic Council team that pulled this together. I'm thrilled to be here with these distinguished panelists to talk about a very hot topic at this COP. I, I recently read an article by Vaclav Smeal, the noted energy historian, prolific guy. Uh, and th this is a short article. And in the article, he looks at a statement that he says he hears a lot when people say, we put a man on the moon, why can't we solve the problem of climate change? And Professor Smeal says in this article, that's actually a very silly statement, he says. And he offers a number of reasons. And one of them, he says, is going to the moon was a discreet project, complicated, but very discreet. Solving climate change involves transforming yeah. uh, industrial sectors, economies, and more. And then he did some research, and he, he said, based on his research, he believes the Apollo project that put a man on the moon cost about $200 billion in today's dollars, about $200 billion. In contrast, the problem of climate change and addressing the problem of climate change is a several trillion dollar challenge over the course of several decades. That's, there are different estimates out there. Some say $2 trillion, some say $3 trillion. But mobilizing capital at at least one order of magnitude above what it took to put a person on the moon is needed to solve the problem of climate change. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this panel with a particular focus on emerging markets. This has already been a big part of this COP. On the first day of this COP, we had a headline announcement about a loss and damage fund, and congratulations to uh, President Sultan al-Jabbar of the COP and others for pulling that together. Um, we had a big announcement on a $30 billion fund and with a lot more money coming in. Um, and I think more is coming in this area. There have been a number of announcements. I, my, my colleague and friend Mark Gologli and others have pulled together something called Allied Climate Partnership, which, is mo which has already raised several hundred million dollars of philanthropic capital to leverage much more. So, so there's, thank goodness, a lot of attention to this in this COP, but, but much more is needed in this area, and we couldn't have a better panel uh, to address it. Um, we, we have on this panel, we have two representatives from um, uh, multilateral development banks. The pri we have one from the private sector and two from national governments. And so, so let's get into it and, and turn to, uh, let me see if I can get this right, Demetrius. Demetrius Papathanaseu. How did I do uh, with your last Excellent. name? Excellent. <laughs> I'm glad to hear. Um, Demetrius um, uh, is the uh, direct, uh, is global director for energy and extractives uh, at global practice at the World Bank. So a key person on this agenda. Um, and MDB reform is very much part of the dialogue at this COP. It has, you know, very, very much in dialogue at COP27 as well. Uh, give us an update, Demetrius, what's happening at the World Bank in terms of financing the energy transition and, and with World Bank reform overall. Thank you very much, David. Really appreciate the effort to get my name right as well. Thank you. <laughs> it's very good. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me... Uh, let me walk you through our thinking on how do we get the energy transition done. So we issued uh, a paper last uh, April, which we called intentionally, and we put it in the title, Scaling Up to Phase Down. Because for the countries where we work, what we see is that demand for energy grows, and it should grow because these countries need economic growth, and it is impossible to have an economy unless you have energy. So we looked at uh, what has been going on, what are the difficulties with getting uh, acceleration for the clean energy, and the reality is that in the developing world, people need energy, so it is important to have a discussion which is meaningful on scaling down uh, coal, scaling down fossil fuels. We have to be able to provide an alternative which is equ equivalent in terms of reliability, it is cleaner, and it also needs to be affordable. Because if we don't do that, then all the discussions about phasing down fossil fuels become extremely difficult, and we actually see it happening uh, at cup after cup. So we put our heads together and said, okay, so what will it take for the world to do the energy transition? And we said, first of all, we should start with the power sector, electricity. This is where already we have technologies that can be competitive on a per unit basis on energy in terms of affordability. And then we did the numbers. And you mentioned what Vaslav Smil wrote about the cost and all that. 
And, but let's put this into perspective. People estimate, and we did similar estimates, that we need, by the end of the decade, to be investing more than a trillion dollars in the developing world for clean energy, and that excludes investment in China. China is so big that it is an outlier. So we said, okay, let's leave the outlier out and look at the rest. And we estimate that we need, in the developing world, 1.2, 1.3 trillion by 2030. Now, we also looked at what the developing world spends today in the power sector for fuels. And the number is half a trillion per year. So, this is an equation that works. All that needs to happen in the world is take the recurrent spending for burning fuels and turn it into servicing equity and debt obligations for the very high capital expenses that we need to do the clean energy transition. What is also interesting to note, again, since we're talking numbers, and in the World Bank we really look at the numbers all the time, just last year, if you look at the level of uh, subsidies that went in the world, in financial terms, not economic terms, this is real money, it was 1.3 trillion that went into subsidies for consumption of fossil fuels. So, yes, these are huge numbers, but energy is the largest industry, the largest sector of the economy in the world, and the figures can work out. So, just to close, and again, I encourage you to have a look at our report, Scaling Up to Phase Down, we try to look at what else needs to be in place, because financing is, of course, important, but then financing <coughs> needs terms and conditions and an environment where it can flow in. And we came up with a notion, what we call the virtue cycle, we said we need to do a few steps to get things going. First of all, we need governments to, give, to have an ambition for clean energy, give a clear policy signal to the world of what they want to do. Then we need to put in place laws, regulations that will get things going, institutions that are capable, which can then start helping with preparing a pipeline of bankable projects, then we as MDBs can come in with our de-risking instruments, with our financing, our guarantees, the, the fancy stuff that we can do to protect capital. Then, as long as we can have competitive processes and procedures on auctions, and we have seen how successful these procedures can be here in the Gulf, where you get some of the cheapest clean energy in the world, and then that gives you the results. And then it is these results when suddenly countries see that with clean energy they can get very competitive prices that then drives ambitions even further. And this is not theory. This is what happened in the UK with the offshore wind. This is what we did in practice in India with the solar story. And this is how we can get things going. So let me stop here. Demetrius, thank you very much. Let, let's turn to the uh, largest region in the world by population to Asia um, and, and to um, Pradeep Tharakan, who's director of the energy transition at the Asia Development Bank. What programs do you have underway? What are you doing with respect to uh, capital, capital availability for um, the energy transition in Asia? Thank you very much, David, and good afternoon, everybody. As you mentioned, I think uh, the Asia Pacific or developing Asia Pacific is really at the forefront of the energy transition. You've got an extremely diverse set of circumstances. You've got countries such as PRC and India planning for export scale hydrogen projects. You've got the largest solar parks and renewable energy projects in the world happening in this, in this part of the region. Um, you also have about 100 million people who are still struggling to have access to electricity. And, and a larger number of those don't even have access to sustainable cooking fuels or sustainable transport. So clearly, um, you know, ADB's got its work cut out. We've got our work cut out for us. So as a result of the, the G20 discussions around on capital adequacy framework reviews and MDB reform, um, what we did in 2021 is to essentially put out a new energy policy and we took a clear stand and said we will not finance coal-fired power generation anymore. So that was a clear position we took. And second is we have um, agreed with the other MDBs to have all our sovereign operations, meaning lending to governments to be Paris aligned, um, you know, in the middle of this year, and our private sector operations to be aligned in the next couple of years. And we took a look at our balance sheet and said, okay, we are small. 
uh, we need to be strategic, but let's see if we can bring more resources to bear. So with a little bit of uh, you know, financial restructuring and stretching our balance sheet, we've now uh, freed up about $100 billion of, of new resources to be deployed between, uh, the, in this decade. So what that means is our sustainable level of lending goes up from about $22 billion a year to $36 billion a year. Um, I think we also need to put things in perspective, just to pick up on what Demetrius was saying. All of the MDBs together currently lend about three to $400 billion a year across all sectors, not just energy, okay? And as Demetrius was saying, if you, if you include the energy transition needs, that's about $2 trillion a year. But so the MDBs have a very important role to play, and we can talk about that in more detail, but they can't solve all of the problems. They need to actually, we need to leverage with, the, with our clients, the public sector, domestic financial institutions. We need leverage with the private sector in a big way. And, and, and we also need to work with new partners, such as philanthropies. Um, they're really stepping up to the plate. We see a lot of announcements coming through. But again, a, an interesting perspective. Recently, McKinsey put out a report that says that less than 5% of philanthropic capital on an annual basis goes towards climate and energy. Mm. A lot of it goes towards education, social sector, um, you know, social development, all important areas, don't get me wrong, but, but it, it's important that we look at all these sources of finance together. Uh, let, let me stop here. Thanks. Well, let's turn to one important, maybe the most important source of capital, the private sector. And uh, Linda Elling Lee is um, uh, with the M founding director and head of the MSC Sustainability Institute, which, um, what, uh, Linda, why don't you tell us what you do at MSC Sustainability Institute and, and how you see this going now? Sure, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's, uh, it's important to kind of provide a different aspect in terms of uh, finance. So MSCI is the largest index provider in the world, so there are nearly $15 trillion that are benchmarked to MSCI's indexes. And within those $15 trillion, we're seeing an increasing um, amount that is actually um, benchmarks that are climate aware or climate aligned, and that's because uh, the world's global um, institutional investors, the largest asset owners and, and sovereign wealth funds and, and, and investment institutions are increasingly want to manage their um, portfolios um, towards uh, reflecting their views on the energy transition. So we're already seeing that there are hundreds of billions of dollars that are systematically being reallocated um, through these indexes towards companies that are actually improving in terms of their alignment with the energy transition. <coughs> Now, emerging markets, um, the emerging markets uh, portion of the investable market, publicly listed equities, um, is about 11%. Yeah, so 11% in the global um, public, uh, publicly listed equities um, is actually uh, in emerging markets. And so to the extent that uh, global institutional investors are con now sort of reallocating towards um, uh, climate aware and, and uh, you know, net zero aligned companies, you know, that some of the emerging markets companies that are in the 23 countries that are in the emerging markets index would benefit from that. Um, however, um, there is some barriers. I think that emerging markets um, companies um, have traditionally really kind of lacked the transparency and the disclosure that investors like to have. So in addition to indexes, um, MSCI is also the largest provider of any type of sustainability um, factors, including climate data and models, and 90% of the large um, asset managers um, in the world actually use our climate data models um, to, to manage their portfolios. Um, and so what they've traditionally asked for for emerging market companies actually is more around governance-related data. That's just been a long-standing lack of transparency that really does actually um, uh, weigh on the, the increases the, uh, the risk premium uh, for emerging market companies. But now they're really asking for climate data, and that's because they really have to look through their entire portfolio because they have to revalue and reprice every asset across their portfolio for different um, permutations of climate scenarios going forward, and they don't have that data. Um, we're beginning to see quite a lot of improvements in terms of corporate disclosure on, on climate-related data. Um, in Asia in particular, I think many of the financial regulators and the exchanges in, um, in many of the markets in Asia um, have actually put uh, mandatory disclosures in place for uh, their companies to, to be able to um, 
provide the types of climate risk uh, data that's aligned with um, some of the standards that are coming out. The International Sustainability Standards Board is something that is codifying some of the um, some of the, the frameworks around the climate di risk disclosure that the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, had put out. So that's a huge win, I think, for global investors in terms of the ability over the next couple of years to be able to have much better um, data. Um, I, I would also say that the other pressure point, I think, for companies, um, particularly, I think, in the Asia uh, in the Asian markets, to be paying attention to um, providing more transparency on their, their climate risks um, is that uh, the large multinational companies are having to uh, look at their entire value chain. And so all their supply chain, all the, all the smaller, uh, uh, the SMEs that are, that are uh, located throughout um, the, the emerging markets, especially in Asia, are now having to um, disclose and or look at kind of what, uh, what their um, climate impacts might be because they have to report that up to their clients, which are the larger multinationals. Um, so maybe I stop there. Thank you, Linda. And I want to come back to the topic of data, which is very hot and interesting. But but first, go to our representatives of national government, starting with Javier Campillo, who is Vice Minister of Energy at, for the Republic of Colombia. Um, uh, Javier, to what extent is is financing a constraint on the energy transition in Colombia? And what I know your your head of state has been very committed on the energy transition. What's happening there? Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invite. Well, we started a couple of years ago in about 2014 when we passed the renewable energy law. And we started from a technological point of view. So we started changing our energy matrix. Our energy matrix is, is rather clean. It's mostly hydropower. But in order to achieve our energy transition, we still have a, a large transport sector, especially for cargo. Um, and so, so we need to address the fact that we're still relying a lot on fossil fuels, and one of the big challenges is that we're not just consumers, but we're also producers. So when you have a system where you're relying a lot on not just using fossil fuels, but also exporting, um, it's, it, it becomes a challenge to change your internal matrix while at the same time providing an additional economy in the country uh, to, to deal with what Dimitris was saying. I really like the term, and I'm going to steal it, uh, to scale up the phase down. And so, we, we have this double challenge. So we, we are addressing our internal economy that still relies heavily on fossil fuels, but at the same time on exporting fossil fuels. So we are working on both areas. But the good thing is that through investments, and we are investing a lot from the government, we're having a heavy private investment. Just to give you an overview, our energy system is about 20 gigawatts in capacity. And the last round of investment for renewables was about 56 gigawatts, um, where we could allocate about seven gigawatts because you know our energy system can only take so much. Uh, but that means that there is heavy interest, and we need close to 120 gigawatts by 2050 if we want to. Um, we're talking about electrifying our industry and our transport sector. So there is a lot of room for investing, and and our system in Colombia we have a lot of renewable sources both in solar, wind, but also geothermal. Um, we still have a lot of small-scale hydropower, biomass. So the country itself, it's a large country, and we have a lot of potential all around the country. And, and a what we see is that a lot of the knowledge that we have, for instance, on the coming from the oil and gas sector, when, we com when it comes to offshore exploring, we have the knowledge offshore to shift away from you know fossil fuels offshore to wind offshore, so to offshore wind, and and we just announced here at the COP our first round of investment for offshore wind, for for example. So what we want here is to use to use the experience from our companies to collaborate with other companies with investors to shift away while at the same time creating jobs and reindustrializing our whole economy. Uh, and I know it sounds very ambitious, but we just don't have any other choice. When it comes to coal, for example, uh, we had a couple of years ago, about three, four years ago, um, for the first time in Colombia's history, um, a coal mine uh, was shut down because it was just not profitable for the company who was using that coal. So it was the first time where a company who had the right, the mining titles for coal, uh, and st with still a lot of coal in that mine, and I said, well, it's just not profitable enough, and I'm just going to give it back to the government. And, and we now have the challenge for that whole community to shift away from coal 
instantly. We didn't have time. We didn't have 10 years to plan, to plan it ahead to see, okay, what are we going to do after you know, this mine closes? It just closed down. So what we're looking at now is we're looking at all this around the country and looking at this as, a, as an opportunity, as an opportunity for shifting away from fossil fuels but creating a stronger and more sustainable economy for the years to come. So that's how we're looking at it. Thank you, Javier. Last but very much not least, uh, Adam Wang Levine is, plays a key role on these issues at the U.S. Department of Treasury as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment and Infrastructure. Adam, two, two questions for you. First, mm -hmm. Vice President Kamala Harris was here in town and made some announcements in this area. Could you share with us what the Vice President announced? And then be very interested in your thoughts on the MDBs um, and MDB reform in this area and, and what the U.S. government's uh, approach and policy is at this point. Sounds good, and thank you. And I see class might resume in a few minutes, so I'll try to keep my uh, remarks brief. Um, it's lunch, actually, so that's a real <laughs> that's right. Um So related to the announcements, uh, Vice President Harris announced two things with respect to the Green Climate Fund and the Climate Investment Funds this week. Um, the first was announcing a $3 billion pledge to the Green Climate Fund, or GCF, and we're incredibly excited about this pledge just because the GCF is the largest multilateral climate fund. And we've actually been co-chairing as the U.S. Treasury um, our, in our role with the fund. And we've been pushing forward two things that we're incredibly excited about. The first is recently uh, Mafalda Duarte joined as the executive director at the GCF. And we're very excited about the agenda that she can bring to making the institution even more effective. I think the second thing related to our announcement is the strategic plan for the fund in which they've chosen to focus on three areas of reform related to providing more access, particularly to lower income countries, as well as better leveraging its resources and balance sheet, and finally reforming its operations to be more effective. The second announcement that we made was around the climate investment funds, particularly the clean technology fund. And this announcement came alongside a new initiative that the, uh, that the Biden administration is pushing related to clean energy supply chains, in which we're trying to work with several countries in ways in which we can support the development of clean energy supply chains globally. But with respect to the commitment, it's $568 uh, million dollars that we're now loaning to the CTFs. And we're incredibly excited about what it can do with respect to new programming, particularly around these clean energy supply chains and industry decarbonization, but also continuing to support the existing set of programming. The other thing that was part of this announcement was related to the SIF Capital Markets Mechanism, a bit jargony, but it's a new way for the SIFs to access financing from capital markets, which isn't as regular, um, particularly for funds like them. And we're incredibly excited, not only for what this can do for the SIFs, but also for what this can do for climate funds more generally, in terms of thinking about a new way in which they can access financing. With respect to the MDBs, obviously the Treasury has been pushing a pretty ambitious evolution agenda. Um, just for context, I think our view was, in many ways, the MDBs were not programmed to focus on global challenges, like pandemics, like climate change. And so, Within the Treasury Department, we've been trying to push forward a four-pillar agenda with respect to MDB evolution. The first is, can we reform the ways that the MDBs think through its mission, its incentive structures, its operational approaches, and its financial capacity? I think we're already starting to see some of those effects more generally, where we think we're mobilizing at least another $50 billion over the next 10 years in terms of additional financing capacity. But even more specifically within climate finance, I think we're starting to see these changes where in the most recent MDB climate finance report, we actually saw in 2022 that the MDBs increased the amount of climate finance that they provided by $10 billion to reach almost $60 billion. Maybe putting that number into additional context is, I think many of us are familiar with the 100 billion target that we have for climate finance. And so I think by many indications, we may already be there. Uh, Adam, thank you very much. Um, I want to come back, as I said, to data, and just partly because it's a topic that I've been thinking about. I, I've spent much of the past year working on how we can use the hot topic of artificial intelligence to help mitigate climate change emissions, and just released a report on that two days ago. And one of the conclusions of our report is that data accessibility, availability, and standardization is absolutely essential to using these new tools that are 
emerging so rapidly. Um, and Ellen, you mentioned data, and, and, and data is very central to what you're doing um, at MSC Sustainability Institute. Um, I wonder um, to, to what extent is the lack of, you started to get into this, but maybe elaborate, to what extent is the lack of good data constraint on what you do, and are there ways that, that emerging markets can produce better data to help with financing? Yeah, so um, technology has been, has really transformed the sustainability data landscape um, over the last decade, really. And so, because it's always been a very challenging area, so we've always had to use um, the last generation, the NLPs and so the natural language processing and so forth to actually um, get data, make it more consistent and QA the data. Now this newer generation, especially with AI, it's really changing the game. Um, a couple of areas that's really um, transforming how much um, information you can really get without relying on corporate disclosure is um, geospatial data, right? So we've just launched our asset location, um, geo, uh, MSCI geospatial data, where, where investors are now able to look at over a million assets that are linked to the companies that are in their portfolios and you're able to see not just the physical characteristics because you need that to be able to map that to different climate hazard maps, eventually to natural, um, natural capital losses. Um, those are all like the base data sets you really need to have is to know the characteristics and the financial value and potential financial loss of, um, of these assets. Now another thing that's really I think changing the game um, and that we're going to see a huge amount of more information in emerging markets is um, is because uh, of the language processing skills and so the translation skills. I think that's been a huge barrier in terms of being able to um, capture relevant um, sustainability and climate related data. And now we're going to be able to do that, um, you know, just through the, the power of AI. Uh, there's just going to be transportation data, all sorts of data that is actually locked up in, say, national, um, much more kind of language based national databases are sort of th the kinds of things that we're going to be able to access. And so I think that there's going to be an unleashing of this information and investors really need it because it's very, very difficult to think about reallocating capital um, without sufficient information to make the kinds of uh, repricing decisions that, that global investors need to make. All right, we're down to our last two and a half minutes according to the clock. Uh, let me ask uh, anyone else on the panel, one, if, if this question of data is something that's emerging in, in your world you'd like to comment on, or alternatively, if there's a topic you wanted to get in here but you haven't been able to and you can do it in 20 seconds, please let us know. Demetrius, you're nodding your head. You, so get, you go. So I think the, the opportunity that we have and one of the, the good things that is coming up from this cup is the agreement to triple clean energy. And that is the great part. I mean, we've been advocating for our scaling up to phase down. So this is, this is great news. And I think what Linda mentioned in terms of there is a lot of capital that is looking to do the right thing. We know that there's a lot of capital that wants to come for clean energy investment in the emerging uh, markets. Because if you look at the map, that is where most of the w solar resources are. That's where the, most of the wind resources are. So if the cost of technology and deploying the technology is the same, then what prevents things from happening is the fact that the cost of capital is much higher in our countries. So I think the opportunity that we have is that with bringing the MDBs in for the right type of projects and, and in a sense the kind of a stamp of approval that this project has been prepared in the right way and it respects environmental, social and governance uh, issues, that should help us to really unlock additional capital and really leverage our own resources because the MDB resources are limited but the real opportunity is leveraging everyone else. And I think that is what I feel I'm getting from, from this panel as a useful thing that we have to see how can we accelerate doing that as well. Mm -hmm. Please. If I could just uh, make a quick plug for transition finance. Just building up on what Dimitri said, we need to do unique things as MDBs. And first of a kind projects is one thing we do very well. The second is everybody wants to finance green, but brown to green, hard to abate sectors, phasing out fossil fuels in an accelerated manner. These are areas where we could do a lot of work. And earlier this week, we did announce an MOU with the Monetary Authority of Singapore um, and GIAP with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet to set up a, a large fund to support these sorts of transition projects. But we need concessional funding, and that's where corporations, philanthropies, and bilateral donors would be extremely important partners. Uh, Javier, Adam, you've got the last word. Any final thoughts? <laughs> I really like the fact that we're talking about AI, and I think it's really important right now because changes are happening so fast, and our 
prediction models and our roadmaps, every country has one, um, they have to be dynamic enough in that in case we have a technological breakthrough, let's, let's say if we find a way to make hydrogen, green hydrogen, cleaner and cheaper, we need to adjust those models really fast to change the way we're playing those roadmaps. So it's the, the, the recommendation here is to make sure that our planning models are dynamic enough to be adjustable to the rapid changes that are happening on the technology side. Try to tackle both. Um, so <laughs> the first on data and AI, I'm recently arrived to the US Treasury. I was previously working in venture capital, so I think there's an incredible amount of exciting work being done here, particularly in academic institutions like yeah. Stanford, which I'm alumni of, but also in the uh, um, more official capacities of governments and the private sector. I think there's some interesting work that's being done at the Climate Data Steering Committee with their launch of the Net Zero Public Data Utility recently. Mm. That's worth investigating on the data side. And then I would say, and I think there's something also interesting to look into with transition finance, I would agree with that. Um, and I think this is something that the G20 will also be looking at and GFANS has done as well. And my final thing would be on the topic of maybe more blended finance. Um, I think I keep hearing that the public sector doesn't understand, the private sector needs to make its case. I would say we're open to hearing these things. This is an active focus for the Treasury Department. Coming from the private sector, I definitely want to hear views, and we're actively thinking about whether it's political risk insurance, FX de-risking, things that we can do within the U.S. Treasury or through the MDBs, how we can mobilize private capital. This is an incredibly important area of focus and would welcome your views on that. Please join me in giving a hand to this tremendous panel.